Cleaning and sanitizing, the difference between the two. Cleaning involves removal of food and dirt and grease from a cleaning agent. Uh, remember, green is clean. If you look at the green buckets in the kitchen, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Look at the green buckets in the kitchen, you'll see it says detergent right on the bucket. All right. The next ones are the red buckets. All right. Sanitizing. When you are sanitizing, you're reducing the microorganisms to a safe amount, trying to kill them all. So green is clean, red is dead. You look for the red buckets, sanitizing solution goes in the red buckets. If you have towels that you're not using, uh, during production, they are to be stored in the red cleaning buckets, not in, excuse me, the red sanitizing buckets, not in the green cleaning buckets. Um, if the health department comes in and sees there's towels in the green cleaning buckets, then they'll write you up. That's not, that's, that's not acceptable. <clears throat> Non-food uh, contact areas. In this photo, you can see there's plenty of tables. The tabletops are food contact areas. The sinks are food contact areas. But the walls, the top of the hood, the outside of the refrigerators, the, um, the outside of the, the towel dispenser, that's all non-contact food areas, but they need to be cleaned and rinsed. You do not need to sanitize them. All right. The contact food areas, the cutting boards, the um, utensils that you cook with, the pots, the pans, the spoons, the knives, the forks, um, the tabletops, all those things need to be cleaned, uh, rinsed, and sanitized. All right. The proper way to clean and sanitize is to clean the surface with a uh, with soap, uh, rinse the surface with plain water, uh, sanitize the surface, get that red bucket out, get your red uh, get your towel in the red bucket and wipe it all down, and allow the surface to air dry. Never use towels to air dry or to to dry. Um, the towels can harbor bacteria. You want to make sure that the, the air dries. Put the sanitizer on and let uh, the sanitizer do its work. Um, when do you clean and sanitize? After um, after being after the tables are being used, um, before you start another task. So if I pull out chicken and I cut chicken, I want to put the chicken away. I want to remove the cutting board and the knife and all the utensils I was using. Wash, rinse, and sanitize my table. Get new knives or get you know after you wash, rinse, and sanitize your your cutting board and your knife. Bring it back out and then begin again. Um, if you get interrupted, and by that I mean um, if you're working on chicken and you're cutting it for, uh, for, uh, prepping it for an event and then somebody calls you and you get called away to go cook on the line, you know, you're going to be gone for a while. You put your chicken away, you go and you do your line work. Then you come back. Um, your chicken has been refrigerated. It's fine. But your cutting board has been sitting for an hour and a half in the danger zone. You want to remove the cutting board, wash and rinse, sanitize the area. Get a fresh cutting board and a, a, a nice clean knife and then begin to uh, work again. And then um, it's rare for someone to be standing in one spot. But if you're working at a huge catering a hall or a big convention center, it's possible you can work on the same item for more than uh, for more than four hours. And if that's the case, you start working at noon, uh, about 3.30, you want to break everything down, wash, rinse, sanitize, and get all new equipment um, so that you, you make sure that the microorganisms are not building up on that cutting board um, and having time to incubate in the danger zone. All right, with the cleaning agents, you always wanna make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions no matter what. There's four different types that you need to know for the kitchen. Uh, one is detergent, that's gonna be your pot soap and your hand soap. Um, next one is degreaser and that's used to cut through grease. Um, the nature of the business that we have is grease particles that fly around in the kitchen all the time and um, you need to have degreaser to, to cut through that stuff. It's usually pretty potent and it usually needs to be uh, diluted with water. Uh, delimers, a lot of times um, on the inside of your dishwasher, you'll see a white residue and that's because you have the pH balance or the mineral deposits from your water. Uh, you have hard water. Um, the, the limer will, will uh, remove uh, that white substance from the inside of your dishwasher. Um, and then abrasive cleaners like uh, Comet, those are the, those are the kind of hard uh, things that you use to scrub. Um, chemical storage, you want to make sure that you only purchase from a reputable vendor and you want to make sure that you store them uh, when they come in, in the container they came in. Like I mentioned, the degreaser is very possible that it needs to be diluted by water. So then you might want to transfer it into another container. If you do, you have to make sure you label that container. Um, I was working at a place one time. We had this uh, degreaser called Big Red. Fabulous degreaser. Really works great. Um, but when it's sitting there in a plastic container, it looks exactly like red wine vinegar. 
uh, one of my uh, utility people decided that it was a really good uh, thing to use. It needs to be diluted by water. So he put it into a squeeze bottle, like a ketchup squeeze bottle. Um, we use those on the line, especially when we're plating up food. It's nice to put little squiggly lines on and that kind of stuff. Um, so he looked for a spray bottle, couldn't find one. He found one of those squirt bottles, put the water in, put the de uh, put the uh, the big red degreaser in, and left it at the dishwasher because he had it like at his you know I was ready, just squirt it on the thing, scrub away, and away it goes. So I walked by, I saw it, thought it was uh, red wine vinegar in a squirt bottle. I grabbed it and started walking to the chef's line. And luckily I smelt it as I was walking along and it's not vinegar at all. I thought it was vinegar. I was going to put it with the, with the salad dressings. Um, it's not, it's red wine. It's, it's a uh, big red uh, degreaser. So make sure you label because otherwise somebody could get really, really sick. Um, if you don't label it when it comes out of the container that it came in. Um, cleaning chemicals and tools ought to be separate, ought to be in a whole separate room. Um, if you can't do that, you have to make sure that your mop bucket is separated from your food. Um, that when you're done with your mop bucket, that you have a drain that's in the floor specifically dedicated for the mop bucket. You cannot pour it in your sinks. You cannot pour it outside. It has chemicals and it has microorganisms. You don't want that. Um, you have to have a sink that's dedicated just for your mops. Uh, when you're done, you do not want to have your mop handle, your, your mop head sitting inside the bucket or sitting inside the ringer. You want to make sure that it's, it's, it's held up, that it's air drying, that it's suspended uh, from the ground, um, that it doesn't allow microorganisms to grow, and it also doesn't allow uh, pests to live inside of it. Same thing with your brooms and any other kind of cleaning utensils. All right. Um, if you don't have sanitizer and you need to sanitize, uh, you have to understand that the hot water needs to be at least 171 degrees and it needs to soak for a minimum of 30 seconds. Uh, the chances of you running into this are slim to none, but there's also the outside chance that you're going to do a catering event and you won't have the sanitizer and you'll need to know that you need to go to 171 minimum. Between 171 and 180 is optimal and for 30 seconds it needs to soak. Uh, most places are going to use uh, chemical sanitizers. We use the chlorine one, 50 parts per million. For seven seconds, it needs to be submerged. There's a quaternary ammonia. Usually it's a brown substance. Um, that needs to be submerged for 30 seconds. And then there's an iodine, and that also needs to be submerged for 30 seconds. Like I said, we use the chlorine one. Um, the chemical dishwashers are also, uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, um, but they're a little different in the sense that they don't need to go as hot, uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the sanitizer's effectiveness. Now concentration means how much liquid and how much sanitizer. Um, when your vendor comes, they should, they should set you up with a machine like this. They should test your water and they should set it up so the proper amount of sanitizer comes out with the proper amount of water. So two things happen. One, if you're using too much sanitizer, um, it's not good, it's not effective, um, it's uh, kind of toxic. So you want to make sure you're using the proper amount of sanitizer. If you don't have enough sanitizer, well, then you're just right, you're just spraying it down with water, and that's not helping you either. So the concentration needs to be correct. There are um, test strips that you can use, and what you do is you dip the test strip into the sanitizer, and you hold it up to the to the container, and it will the color of the sanitizing strip will, will change, and you want to match the color on the on the container, and it'll tell you how many parts per million. Um, by the color of the sanitizer. I go back to this because the chlorine, the, qu the uh, quaternary ammonia, and the iodine are different kinds of things. You need the different test strip. Make sure you have the appropriate test strip for the appropriate sanitizer that you have. If you have the wrong test strip and you're not testing anything because it's not right, the health department will certainly write you up for that. Temperature, sanitizer effectiveness is control is is affected by temperature. You have to follow the manufacturer's instructions. The chlorine one that we use, it uh, calls for cold water. So when we're filling the, the the sanitizing sink, the water needs to be cold. When we're filling the, the the soap sink, the water needs to be hot. And there's a there's a device on the machine where you can change that. Um, contact time, sanitizer is no good if you just dip it in and take it right out. Sanitizer needs to be used the right way. Um, you need to have uh, it needs to be in there if it's the iodine one for 30 seconds. So <clears throat> you just don't just put it in there. 
you put it in and let it sit for 30 seconds. Um, I like ours better, the chlorine, because you don't need 30 seconds and you can go a little quicker. Water hydrants and pH, I talked about that a second ago. Both of those can affect the sanitizer. Um, both of those should be the, the when they install your, your equipment, they should do a test of your water and make sure that it's not too hard or the pH balance is right. Therefore, it won't affect the sanitizing solution. And the other thing that can break it down and make it not be as, as, uh, as effective is uh, food bits and leftover detergent. So like I said earlier, you're going to put your, your bucket, you're going to put your towel in your sanitizing bucket. You clean your table down and you wipe it down with your sanitizing bucket and let it air dry. Um, if there's food that ends up in that bucket, if there's detergent from the, from the table that ends up in there, it can reduce the potency and time too. If you fill it at six o'clock in the morning and don't, don't, don't change it out and refill it, um, you know, every three or four hours, the potency of that sanitizing solution is not really all that good. And the last thing you want is the health department to come in and go to your sink and check the potency and it's right. And then go to one of your sanitizing buckets and check that potency. And it's not even close. Um, here's the three bay pot sink and the things that I want to talk to you about the, the proper way to use it. Um, on the far right hand side here, we have the rinse, scrape and soak. You have to have a garbage pan. Um, what I like to do is this pot, this, this sink right here. I do not fill completely with water. I have a five gallon bucket that I fill with hot soapy water and I use a scrubber and I scrub the outside of my pots and my pans. I tell my students, make sure that you understand there's two sides to the pan, the inside and the outside. You have to clean both. Cannot let grease and all kinds of microorganisms uh, uh, get, build up on the outside of the pots and pans. You have to wash both the inside and the outside. Uh, the second sink is the rinse sink. The thing you need to understand here is that you need to rinse all the soap and the dirt uh, and, the, and the water off of it at that, not the water, the soap and, and the dirt off of it in that sink. Um, I do not fill my sink with hot water. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it because what ends up happening is you get a film of grease around the outside. And then how clean is this? You clean it, and then you put it in this grease water. It doesn't make any sense to me. I like to spray it off or like to rinse it off with, with, with running water to make sure all the soap and, and, and dirt has been removed. And then I put in my sanitizer. My sanitizer I fill as high as I possibly can go because the stuff needs to be completely submerged. And it needs to be in there with our chemicals, seven seconds. If it's the iodine or the quat, you need to be in there for 30 seconds. And then when you put it on the on the, the, the drying board, it needs to be upside down. Do not put it up there right side up because the water will, will congregate in the bottom of it and it won't dry. Um, the other thing that's important in this area is a clock with a second hand. Because if you have to use a 30 second uh, sanitizer, you need to be able to, you have, you have something to measure it by. All right, this just goes over exactly what I said. First step is to rinse or scrape. Second step is to wash everything in that first sink and make sure that um, that uh, the sink is the water is at least 110. The third step is to go to the second sink and make sure you remove all traces of food and detergent. The fourth step is to go to the sanitizer sink and make sure whether whether you're using the hot water for 30 seconds, iodine for 30 seconds quad for 30 seconds or the uh, um, the chlorine for seven seconds. You're doing it properly. And the last step is to air dry items and turn them upside down. Never use a towel to dry them. If you need something immediately, always get a paper towel, single use paper towel, so you know there's no microorganisms on it and you're not just reintroducing microorganisms to a clean item that you just washed. Uh, high temperature machines, dishwashers, um, both the high temperature ones and the chemical ones, Right on the machine, it'll say there's usually a knob. Uh, uh, um, uh, there's usually a uh, uh, what do you call it? Like a thermometer on the ins that, that that goes to the inside of the machine. Right on the, on the machine itself, and it'll say 180 for rinse. Um, and you have to make sure that you monitor this on a regular basis. Uh, this is part of a HACCP program. Make sure you monitor it. Make sure that it's not too hot because it'll vaporize the sanitizer and make sure that it's getting to the proper temperature, at least hot enough to make sure the, proper the sanitizer is effective. Um, chemical sanitizing machines. I haven't seen any, I haven't seen one of these in 30 years, but um, the wash, wash temperature needs to go to 120. The rinse temperature needs to go between 75 and 120. And you have to use the recommend, recommended sanitizers and follow the manufacturer's instructions. Um, the next thing you need to know about is MSDS sheets or SDS sheets. They used to be in these yellow books and called MSDS. Now they're going to this white book. 
Um, either way, they need to be prominently uh, displayed in the kitchen somewhere where you can see them. Um, and explains uh, it's mandated by OSHA. OSHA stands for Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's the Department of the Government, and what it does is it makes sure that uh, workspaces are safe. And part of that is they mandate that chemical manufacturers um, issue uh, MSDS sheets, and they have to have the following things on them. Safe use and handling, so it explains how to use it. Uh, physical health, fire, um, and hazards, so it explains how to store it. Um, precautions explains what you should do and things, uh, steps you should take to make sure you don't get uh, injured or, or it doesn't make you uh, ill. Um, appropriate, appropriate personal protective equipment, so PPE, um, the right PPE that you need to handle this chemical, and it's it's your employer's responsibility to supply you with that. Um, <clears throat> First aid information. So, in the outside chance that somebody uh, drinks it or gets it sprayed in their eyes, uh, the appropriate first aid to, to, to take. The manufacturer's name and address and the phone number. Uh, the date that the MSDS or the SDS sheet was prepared. And uh, the hazardous ingredients that are in there. Uh, we need to understand that it is your um, right to see these MSDS or SDS sheets uh, before you handle a chemical. If your employer is asking you to handle a chemical that uh, you're not feel, you don't feel comfortable with or you don't feel like you understand it, ask for the MSDS sheets. It's their it's their uh, obligation, it's their responsibility to make sure that, they, that you are supplied with that if you ask for it, and it's their responsibility to make sure that they give you the proper PEE, uh, PPE if they're going to have you use it. Um, that takes care of cleaning and sanitizing. And I thank you for listening and hope you have yourself a wonderful day.